Hello, and welcome to this short lecture from the History Teachers Talking Podcast. I am Peter Zablocki. My fellow history teacher and best friend Tom Reska and I co-host full-length episodes of History Teachers Talking Podcast, where we decided to supplement the longer episodes with these short lectures that will be brought to you by either myself or by Tom and dispersed between our regularly scheduled topics and conversations. Today, I will talk about a time when in 1799, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr uncharacteristically joined forces during America's first tabloid murder, and all in under 15 minutes. In 1800, four years before they met in a dueling ground in Weehawken, New Jersey, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr put away their fierce rivalry to join forces for a very high-profile murder trial in New York City. It all began with Elma Sands. Elma Sands was a very pretty young girl, age 22, that moved to New York City. She settled at her cousin Catherine and her husband's home, or rather, I should say, boarding house in Greenwich Village. It was the summer of 1799 when Elma Sands began a relationship with a new boarder by the name of Levi Weeks. Levi Weeks was a young carpenter, except he wasn't just a carpenter. He was actually really well connected as his brother Ezra was the city's most successful architect and builder. And in fact, he was responsible for constructing the Gracie Mansion, now home to all New York's mayors. Furthermore, he was also instrumental in constructing most of the growing city's infrastructure at the time. Among his clients, Ezra had one by the name of Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton actually hired Ezra Weeks to build the only home that Hamilton would ever own and live in, uh, which was uh, known as the Grange, uh, which is actually located today far uptown in Harlem. The relationship between Sands as well as Weeks intensified fairly quickly, and a lot of the members of the boarding house started seeing them together uh, night after night, and it became very apparent that they had a very serious relationship. Because of the fact that she was a Quaker, and the fact that her cousin Catherine and her husband were also Quakers, and she was staying at their home, Elma was very reluctant to let people know that she was having this relationship with Levi. When it was becoming apparent that people were finding out about this relationship, one particular afternoon on December 22nd, um, 1799, Elma Sands told a fellow boarder, and actually her cousin, Hope Sands, that she and Levi had become engaged and they were going to elope that same night. And this kind of begins the story here and the mystery. Weeks reportedly leaves the boarding house in the early evening. After Levi leaves, Elma follows about an hour later. Levi returns home later that night. However, Elma is never seen alive again. The search for Elma starts fairly quickly. Actually, within the first few days of her disappearance, her clothes were found near a Manhattan well. It is a newly constructed water supply system to the north of town, which would become revolutionary for New York City. And ironically, it is also a project that is being put together and built by New York's famous builder, Ezra Weeks, Levi's brother. No one really puts the two together, and even though her clothing is found near this well, no one really looks for her body until January 2nd, so a couple of days later, 1800, the well is finally fully searched, and that is when Sand's body is discovered. The rings later testified that they confronted Weeks about this rumored engagement with Sands and about this actual disappearance. He denied any wrongdoing whatsoever and actually claimed that he was not engaged to Elma in any way, shape or form, and that he did not spend the night of her disappearance with Elma. He left before she even left the house and he stayed at his famous brother's house. Elma's cousin and her husband, the Rings, were very much convinced of Weeks' guilt so they started to supply details to reporters and local papers to try to really get them going. After all, Levi's brother was very famous in town. The couple took Sand's body, Elma's body, and displayed it in their boarding house for full three days. And this is after the body was in a well for a couple of days. So we could kind of imagine what that was like. The idea was to have as many newspapermen as possible reporting on it. A coroner's report is conducted. It is concluded that Sands 
has indeed been murdered. Levi Weeks is arrested fairly quickly. The public sentiment grows very quickly against Weeks. Ezra jumps to his brother's defense. As the court trial is approaching, he basically decides that he is not going to waste or spare any money whatsoever, and he hires the best-known lawyers in the city. It just so happens the two most and best-known lawyers in the city are two men that do not necessarily like one another. One is Alexander Hamilton, a very famous person to serve as the nation's first treasury secretary and the one that created the United States financial system. However, by 1800, Alexander Hamilton is going through a pretty rough time. His political career is more or less on a decline. An embarrassing sex scandal exposed shortly after he left the government had further tarnished his reputation. We do know Hamilton had a growing debt to Ezra for construction of his home, the Grange. He helped Ezra with regards to getting his brother acquitted, primarily to pay off his debt. The other really known lawyer in the city at the time was Burr. Aaron Burr served in a state government before defeating Hamilton's father-in-law in a U.S. Senate race in 1791, and that really kind of started this animosity between the two, Hamilton as well as Burr. And this contentious relationship only got worse as the years progressed between these two rival politicians and attorneys. Hamilton and Burr's paths cross quite frequently because of the fact that one was a Democratic Republican, that is Burr, the other one was one of the founding fathers of the Federalist Party, that being Hamilton. Still, neither of the two men had any experience or too much experience with criminal law, and let alone a murder case of such a big extent or really such popularity. So the third defense lawyer, the true dream team here, was brought in, and that was the future Supreme Court Justice um, Livingston to kind of help them out. So now we have best potential lawyers in the city. You have Livingston, you have Hamilton, you have Burr defending Ezra's younger brother, Levi. The trial began on March 31st, 1800, with Weeks lawyers facing off against a prosecution team that included actually a future New York governor. While normally, at the time, each trial took less than a day, usually about eight hours tops, this particular trial, the People versus Levi Weeks, stretched for more than 40 hours in over two days' time. It was approximately 75 witnesses that took the stand. It was also the first criminal trial in American history to be fully transcribed for posterity. And I think that stems from the fact that it, was, it really garnered such huge public interest in this case, and mainly because, obviously, of the prominent personalities that were involved. And I don't mean just Hamilton and Burr, but also... After all, this was Ezra and Levi Weeks, who were very known members of the New York population. The prosecution case rested in large part on circumstantial evidence. Elma's cousin and others testified about the Sand Weeks relationship that Weeks, and very much about Weeks' unusual behavior in the days after Sand's death. They alleged that Weeks had seduced Sands and that he was looking for an escape because he had potentially gotten her pregnant. And he didn't really want to marry her, so he basically lured her away from the boarding house at that particular night to kill her. One witness even claimed to have seen Elma with two men the night of her death, uh, riding in a sleigh that was similar to own the one owned by Ezra, the older brother of Levi. Now, the defense team of Hamilton, Burr, and Livingston were very quick to kind of chip away at this prosecution's case. Um, the first thing is their medical experts that they brought in refuted defense's team's evidence that Sand's necks had been broken or that her body showed evidence of any trauma. They also stated based on the autopsy that Elma Sands was not pregnant at the time of her death, uh, which is something that the prosecutors had alleged as the possible motive for Levi Weeks to kill her. Several members of the Weeks family insisted that on that particular evening on December 22nd, he was indeed at Ezra's house. And they all mentioned that he did leave for about an hour before returning to the house, which is something the prosecution believed was more than enough time for him to have killed Sands and returned to Ezra's. However, there was really no way to prove what he was doing during that hour. The defense, Levi's defense, uh, really attacked Elma Sands' moral character, and they actually called in witnesses that claimed that Sands slept with numerous other men in this particular boarding house. Some also mentioned that Levi Weeks also had been sleeping with other women, including Elma Sands' cousin Hope at the time, to kind of show that 
Sands knew of this relationship that Weeks was having with her cousin and therefore was left heavily depressed and possibly suicidal in the weeks before her death, trying to kind of play up this idea that she might have killed herself. The most traumatic moment was the cross-examination of another boarder at this boarding house. His name was Richard Croucher. And Richard Croucher was brought in by the prosecution to testify about the relationship between Sands and Weeks. And while he is testifying against um, Sands and Weeks and describing Levi Weeks' advances towards Elma Sands, um, the defense team actually dismantles his entire testimony. And they bring in another witness that claims to have seen Croucher near the Manhattan well, which definitely casts suspicion on one of the prosecution's star witnesses. Around 2.30 a.m. on April 2nd, the defense team rested. At the time, Hamilton actually felt that he did so well in this particular trial that he refused to give a closing argument. The jury took just five minutes to reach a verdict of not guilty. Given the controversy surrounding the acquittal, uh, Weeks, uh, Levi Weeks actually fled New York. He settled in Mississippi, where he became a very successful architect in the years going forward. Croucher, um, who the defense had tried to paint the Sands real murder as the Sands real murder, uh, continued life of crime. Uh, actually, just a month after the Weeks trial, Croucher was convicted for raping his teenage stepdaughter. Um, he was later pardoned and released because they said he was mentally unstable. He then moved to Virginia, where there was a similar incident, and then he fled to native England, where he was reportedly executed for an unknown crime. And here is really the story. Uh, on that particular day, Elma's cousin Catherine reportedly put a curse on Hamilton because she was so upset that he defended this murderer. Now, later that same year, Hamilton and Burr would really clash again, began this spiral into what would bring them to Weehawken four years later, where Aaron Burr would fatally shoot Hamilton. However, that had not yet happened. Thank you for listening to this Bonus History Teachers Talking Podcast lecture. You can check out our website at www.historyteacherstalkingpodcast.com. History is the greatest adventure story. But does it ever leave you wondering what the women were doing all that time? This is Lori from the Her Half of History podcast. And the answer is that some women were seizing power or escaping slavery or spying for their country or creating artistic masterpieces while countless others were doing the laundry, getting married and wondering why their clothes don't have more pockets. If you would like to hear the stories of women doing all of those things, check out Her Half of History at herhalfofhistory.com or wherever you get your podcasts.